Okay, so without further ado, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Katrina Wyman. I'm a professor here at the law school. And in fact, June 2002 marks my 20th year on the faculty here at the law school. I teach classes in environmental law and natural resources law, and I also teach property. I'm also the faculty director of the law school's specialized LLM program in environmental and energy law. And I'm deputy faculty director of the law school's Guarini Center on Environmental Energy and Land Use Law. In the past several years, I've become very interested in what local governments can do to, in, in, in the environmental law um, and policy space. Working with my colleague at the Guarini Center, Danielle Spiegelfeld, I recently helped to lead a large team um, that did a study for the New York City government of whether the city should introduce a carbon trading program to reduce greenhouse gases from large buildings in the city. And Danielle and I are currently working on a book on the environmental challenges that large cities like New York City face and what these cities should be doing to address these challenges. Obviously, climate change is really the most prominent challenge that large cities like New York face these days. Adapting to sea level rise, storms, in other places, the droughts that climate change might bring, um, and limiting greenhouse gas emissions from building and transportations, and buildings and transportation, which are the two major sources of greenhouse gases in cities. These are very important challenges for cities these days. To a notable extent, um, U.S. cities have been left to their own devices until rel relatively recently to try to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to climate change. And this is a paradoxical in my view, because in the 1970s, the federal government became really the preeminent environmental regulator in the US to address air and water pollution um, in large measure, because there was a sense that cities and states were basically incapable of addressing the nation's environmental challenges. So today I wanna to talk about a question that's puzzled me recently as I've been thinking a lot about what local governments should do in, um, in the environmental law space. Why has the US had such difficulty implementing a co comprehensive national framework to address climate change, given that the federal government has had a, such a significant role in environmental regulation for essentially five decades now? This, of course, is, I think, a very topical question, not only for me, given my research, but given the difficulty that President Biden has had in implementing his climate change agenda. As many of you probably know, he came into office with aggressive goals on climate change to achieve 100% carbon-free electricity by 2035, a net zero economy by 2050, and to ensure that historically marginalized communities would receive at least 40% of the benefits of his climate policies. Well, President Biden has had some success in achieving his climate goals. He's had real difficulty achieving them as well. His Build Back Better legislation that included uh, tax credits for clean energy has really been blocked in the Senate. And his ability to use regulatory authority under the Clean Air Act to regulate power plant emissions may be limited by the Supreme Court in a decision it's expected to release this year in a case known as West Virginia v. EPA. So why? Several decades after climate change emerged as a policy issue, has the US not adopted a comprehensive national framework for addressing climate change? I'm really very much in the early stages of thinking about this question and my thoughts today are very tentative. And they also draw very heavily on the work of a political scientist, Professor Matteo Mildenberger, um, who published a book in 2020 called Carbon Captured, where he compared the trajectory of climate policy in the US, Australia, and Norway. So part of what I actually wanna to do today is test out Professor Mildenberger's um, double representation hypothesis on, on you and, and hear your reactions. But I also wanna consider some other possible explanations for why the US has been so, uh, had such difficulty um, actually establishing a comprehensive national framework on climate change. So really there are gonna be four, four parts to the, presentation today, and then I'm going to um, uh, leave time, of course, for questions. So uh, I'm going to start with some background, 
um, that will basically, in which I'll talk about why the US might be expected to have a national climate change policy and some of the challenges involved um, in, in establishing a national climate change policy in the US. Then I'll move to the history of federal efforts to address climate change in the US. And then I'll talk about um, for potential explanations um, for, for where we are today. And then hopefully I'd like to conclude on an optimistic note by talking about you know, some um, um, opportunities and some ways um, um, of possibly moving forward to uh, get to a point where we might indeed have a, a, a comprehensive national response uh, to help us both limit and adapt to climate change. Okay, so let's start with the background. Why would we expect that there might be a, a federal policy, a framework um, uh, to, uh, uh, on climate change? And what are some of the challenges in, um, involved in developing a comprehensive framework? So one clear reason why we might expect that there would be a comprehensive national policy framework on climate change um, is that the US, um, at least uh, in historical terms, is um, as of today, the largest historical emitter. So what this slide is showing you is uh, which regions and which countries within those regions are the largest emitters if you add up all emissions over time since the late um, 1700s until 2017. So who's emitted the most cumulatively? And you see the US is responsible for 25% of global cumulative emissions as of um, 2017. Um, and the EU, 28 countries in the EU are the second largest um, uh, responsible entity in cumulative terms, uh, responsible for 22% as of uh, 2017. Okay. Now, if you look at what's happening annually, you know, which countries are responsible for the most emissions on an annualized basis now, the US is no longer actually the top emitter of greenhouse gases on an annual basis. And it hasn't really been since 2007. So since 2007, actually China has been the top emitter of greenhouse gas emissions on an annual basis. So this, this um, slide is showing you um, as of 2019, which countries are the top emitters um, 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 of, uh, in, in, uh, as of that year. And so here you see China is the top emitter, then you see the US is the second largest emitter. So still a significant, still responsible for a significant share of emissions, 14%. Um, and then you see um, um, India as the third largest emitter and Russia, not surprisingly, um, uh, also as a large emitter. Okay. But these, this is an important trend to keep in mind that the US um, in the past few decades um, has dropped from being the top emitter in, on an annual basis. Now, as the current trends continue and we see changes um, in which countries are the top emitters, of course, these annual um, emissions will catch up and, and affect over time which countries are responsible on a cumulative basis for emissions. So what this slide is showing you is how uh, by, uh, by, by 2100, the US's share of cumulative emissions um, will, will, have, will have been reduced. So the US on a cumulative basis, as I showed earlier, is now the largest emitter. But by 2100, um, actually um, earlier than 2100, by 2050, according to this slide, um, China will actually be on a cumulative basis, the top, um, the responsible for the most emissions cumulatively. And that's the effect of it now being the top emitter on an annual basis. So these are important background trends just to keep in mind. Okay, now, so why has the US, um, you know, it, even in the absence of a national climate change <laughs> comprehensive policy framework, um, on a, uh, um, why has it, um, you know, uh, been, uh, why is it now the number two um, emitter, emitting country annually, although it's still a significant emitter? Well, one reason, it, it's not only because emissions elsewhere have increased, but as this um, slide is showing, US emissions um, starting roughly in the late 2000, 2000s, so you know, US emissions have kind of started to fall somewhat slightly, okay? 
Um, uh, now, uh, there's some interesting explanations for that that maybe we'll talk about a bit later, but it is an interesting point to note, and you see that. Now, it's not exactly a huge drop off. It's certainly nowhere near where those emissions need to go in order to avoid really uh, severe catastrophic effects of climate change, but it's an interesting trend to note. Okay. Um, the other thing that this slide is showing is it's starting to show what might be some of the challenges involved in establishing sort of a comprehensive response to climate change. So one of those challenges is just, you know, how pervasive the emissions are that cause climate change. So this um, uh, slide is showing you, you know, what are the, on a sectoral basis, what are the major sources of GHG emissions? And you see that uh, transportation is right now the largest um, eco uh, sector responsible for greenhouse gas emissions in, in the country. But in addition to reducing um, the way transportation is done in this country to reduce emissions, you would also have to address electricity generation, which you can see here in the blue is the second largest source now um, on a sectoral basis of GHG emissions. So now we have to change not only transportation, but our electricity generation. Um, and then in purple, you see here the industrial sector is also a very major source of USGHG emissions, meaning we're going to have to change that we, uh, the way we make things like cement um, um, uh, to reduce our GHG emissions. We also have to potentially make some changes to agriculture. Okay, as you see here in green, um, agriculture is a source of GHG emissions in the US. Commercial and residential buildings are also big sources of GHG emissions. Uh, think of you who, uh, those of you like me who have gas stoves um, in your houses or apartments, those are a source of GHG emissions. We're actually burning fossil fuels on site um, when we use our gas stoves. So this is a very pervasive problem in our society. That's as this slide is, is illustrating. Okay, now. In addition to the fact that, so, so so far I've given, I think, a few reasons for why one might have expect the US to really, um, at the national level, have a framework um, uh, for addressing climate change. It's a very large emitter, the largest on a cumulative basis historically. Um, the problem of reducing greenhouse gas emissions is uh, sort of a massive problem involving many sectors of modern life. Another reason why you might expect the US to have a comprehensive policy is suggested by this slide. The US, and the next one as well, the US is actually quite vulnerable to the effects of climate change. So this slide is showing um, uh, the areas on the US coast that are vulnerable to sea level rise as a result uh, from climate change. And this slide is showing you vulnerabilities under two emissions scenarios, under a lower scenario where emissions are not as high. What uh, what are the areas that are vulnerable to uh, sea level rise um, in 2100? And on the uh, right-hand side, um, what are the areas and, uh, under a higher emission scenario that are vulnerable to sea level rise? So there are a lot of vulnerabilities. And this slide is also showing another kind of US vulnerability to uh, climate change that you think might prompt a massive policy response, which is um, average uh, the projected average annual increases in temperature. So here you see, um, at, at the end uh, of the slide at the bottom, it says by the end of the 21st century, the temperature will increase an average of 9.3 degrees Fahrenheit. Of course, this assumes a particular emissions trajectory. But the point is, it's going to get hotter, and you might expect some kind of response, not only therefore to limit greenhouse gas emissions, but also to help people think about adapting. Okay, so um, uh, let me now... Uh, at, just highlight, I've already sort of talked about kind of the, the massive challenge of formulating a policy because of the pervasiveness of greenhouse gas emissions are in our economy. Um, let me also talk about one more challenge um, involved in um, uh, formulating a national policy before I go to the second part of the presentation. So uh, another challenge involved in formulating a national policy um, is that there's stark differences, as this slide shows, in uh, the extent to which different regions of the country are, are emitting greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, so this is this uh, map is really showing you greenhouse gas emissions per capita in, in US states. 
and the green parts of the country, so California and New York, or in the green parts of green states, those are states that have, and the yellow states have lower emissions per capita, okay? Conversely, the redder parts of the country um, have, or in the orange parts, have higher uh, per capita uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So you see that in part, not only is this a problem that spans multiple sectors of modern life, but this is a problem that touches different areas of the country differently. So that is also from a federal point of view, of course, an important um, uh, challenge. Um, okay, so before um, I actually go to the second part of the presentation and talk about where we are today, you know, how close has the US actually come uh, to developing a comprehensive policy response? Um, I just want to reiterate, well, what might a comprehensive response look like? Okay, so here I'm just going to show you this slide again. So it, bearing in mind the different sectors that are responsible for greenhouse gas emissions in the United States, you would think that a comprehensive policy response to, to limit climate change, at least in here, I'm not talking about adapting to it, I'm just talking about limiting alone, to limit climate change would, would basically seek to you know, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and really severely reduce greenhouse gas emissions, hopefully even get to the point of eliminating them from these um, major sectors of modern life, from transportation, meaning cars and trucks, from electricity generation, from industri industry, from buildings, residential buildings, for example, and from agriculture. Either we would seek to, you know, drastically reduce greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture or change the demand for agricultural products so that, you know, we're um, shifting towards more agriculture um, that involves producing food for um, human consumption um, that, that emits fewer greenhouse gases. Okay, so when I talk about a comprehensive policy framework, I'm really talking about something that really would span many, many sectors of the economy. Okay, so, so what, where has the, where are we today? How far has the U.S. gotten in, in trying to uh, develop really a comprehensive policy framework that would address really how pervasive, as this slide shows, uh, a greenhouse gas emissions causing climate change are. Okay, so this is a slide that actually started, I, ha I started working on this slide several years ago and every, every uh, periodically I update the slide. So it is a very busy slide, I admit, uh, but um, hopefully you find it kind of an interesting slide to look at. So what this, what this slide is showing is really a couple of things. So above the years, above the vertical um, uh, bar with the years, you see um, international efforts to address climate change, key international efforts to address climate change. So the first sort of leading convention or treaty to address climate change um, was uh, negotiated um, in 1992. It's called the U United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change or the UNFCCC. Okay. Um, um, the just uh, the next significant and effort, and the, the UNFCCC doesn't have any kind of binding um, any sort of binding targets for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It sort of sets out some frameworks and commitments, but 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 no binding targets. The next um, uh, uh, significant uh, development at the international level was the negotiation of the Kyoto Protocol in 1997. So this occurred under the Clinton administration, okay? And the Clinton administration was heavily involved in the negotiation of the Kyoto Protocol. And the Kyoto Protocol imposed binding obligations on industrialized countries, and including the US, to reduce their emissions. But the US, um, as you can see from this slide, close uh, just a few years after the negotiation of the protocol actually repudiated the protocol under um, uh, the second President Bush. Okay, so then the third sort of um, uh, development that at the international level that's highlighted on this slide here is the negotiation of the Paris Agreement in 2015. So the Paris Agreement uh, took a very different kind of architecture than the Kyoto Protocol. The Paris Agreement also does not include um, uh, within its text sort of binding obligations on countries to uh, reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions by a certain 
um, amount by certain years. Uh, the Paris Agreement basically relies on a kind of pledge and review system. So it, it expands obligations to all countries within the world, not just the industrialized or the developed countries. Um, but it doesn't, um, it, it relies on the countries themselves to commit to uh, uh, what they're going to reduce and then relies on basically a series of kind of updating uh, of these countries reporting what they're going to reduce um, and, and then updating their pledges, okay? So those are the key developments at the international level, okay? And what you're seeing um, on the bottom underneath the vertical bar with the years is what was happening domestically at the federal level in the US during this time period when we had these developments at the international level. And um, I've sort of color coded things so that um, all of the developments in Republican administrations are in, in red in various colors of red, depending on who is the president, which is identified at below. And in blue, um, uh, the, uh, uh, you have the developments in, in Democratic presidential administrations. OK, so there are a couple of things. There's, there's a, clearly a lot on this slide, but I'm just going to kind of summarize a few, a few things that I think are important to, to keep in mind. Okay. Um, okay, so one, one key thing to, to keep in mind when you look at what's happening domestically in the US is that there's no major legislation passed by Congress, okay, and, and no regulations coming from the executive branch to regulate greenhouse gas emissions before 2009. Okay, so everything before 2009 you know, on this slide is not referring to any, any piece of legislation that was actually passed by Congress. And there's no reference here to any regulation that was actually, you know, promulgated and took effect that required reduction in greenhouse gases, okay? So any serious effort at the federal level to reduce greenhouse gas emissions comes after 2009, okay? Now, a second sort of important thing to take away here about the traje trajectory of U.S. efforts on climate change is that um, they're actually, even before 2021 and the Biden administration, okay, there actually have been repeated efforts to get legislation through Congress to reduce the country's greenhouse gas emissions. And these efforts actually go back to the 1990s, to, um, okay, at, at, at least to the 1990s. And what you can also see is that um, these legislative efforts in Congress have taken various forms, okay? So in 1993, um, you see here that uh, uh, in the Clinton administration, there was what I referred to on the slide here as a BTU tax proposal. So uh, President Clinton, um, uh, in his first term in office, um, proposed a, a tax. It was an energy, basically an energy tax. I won't go into all, all the details that would have had uh, that would have reduced greenhouse gas emissions. This passed the House, but it died in the Senate. Okay. Um, in then, uh, just to highlight another kind of legislative effort, failed legislative effort, in 2003, you see I have a box um, here for the McCain-Lieberman bill that failed to pass in the Senate. So this was a bill um, pushed by Senators McCain and Lieberman um, in 2003, at the very beginning of the um, uh, 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 George W. Bush administration. Okay. Um, they also pushed, they, they also tried to push the bill for a few years, but it never passed even after this uh, 2003 failure. Okay, this, their bill um, was proposing um, not a tax, but the use of a cap and trade program or emissions trading program, okay? As was um, the next kind of major uh, legislative effort that I'll highlight, which was the uh, Waxman-Markey bill which uh, passed the House, but again, not the Senate, in 2009. So the Waxman-Markey bill came at the very beginning of the Obama administration, and it also proposed the use of a cap-and-trade program, an economy-wide cap-and-trade program, to, um, to, to reduce um, the country's greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. Now, this is sort of some historical context. I've kind of highlighted three legislative initiatives, uh, one involving a tax, two involving uh, proposals to use a cap and trade program. And then, of course, um, if you go to the very left, uh, sorry, the very right side of the screen on, to 2021 under the Biden administration, we see the Build Back Better legislation. So remember, President Biden um, did, was successful in getting his bipartisan infrastructure law passed. 
But he hasn't so far been successful in getting his Build Back Better legislation passed. And the Build Back, legisla uh, Build Back Better legislation is really the legislation through which I think he was trying to implement you know, major components of his climate policy. Okay, and this it now this legislation is interesting because in contrast to the prior proposals to use cap and trade or use um, a tax, um, this legislation relies on spending, relies on tax credits to promote clean energy and various spending initiatives. Okay, so so now we've seen a, a, a different strategy, still not successful <laughs> yet um, at the federal level. Okay, okay, so so far I've highlighted. Um, you know, uh, the failure to really do much at the federal level till 2009. I've also highlighted um, the, um, the fact that legislation, although it's been attempted, so far has not passed, okay? The third thing I wanna highlight about this slide is what did start to happen in 2009, okay? So in 2009, um, at, uh, under the Obama administration, this is when um, you did start to see executive branch regulations to try to reduce the country's greenhouse gas emissions, okay? And why did these um, uh, regulations start in 2009? Well, one reason, one could, uh, reason to the, um, uh, clearly um, you had the President Obama, so the Democrats in control of the executive branch, but another reason which I wanted to highlight here is um, Supreme Court decision in 2007, Massachusetts versus EPA. So in Massachusetts versus EPA, the Supreme Court in a 5-4 decision held that greenhouse gases are air pollutants under the Clean Air Act. And this really created a path for using the Clean, the Clean Air Act to regulate on a sectoral basis greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. And that's what the Obama administration tried to do. So it began by uh, making this uh, finding that was kind of a predicate to regu a sectoral reg uh, regulation called an endangerment finding, which basically held that greenhouse gases uh, endangered public uh, health or welfare. And, set, and that set the stage for then introducing uh, regulations to um, uh, regulate uh, greenhouse gas emissions from cars in 2010 and 2012. And then for the Obama administration's effort to regulate emissions from power plants, the second major source now anyways, of greenhouse gas emissions in this country in 2015, when the Obama administration introduced what's called the, the Clean Power Plan, okay? Now, um, what you also, so in what this slide also shows, in addition to showing that, um, you know, after, 2009, we start to see this push to, to try to regulate at the national level through, through uh, regulations. What this slide shows in a way is how tenuous and vulnerable the regulatory path has been to date, okay? And, and why does it show that? Well, because as this slide shows um, in 2015, um, uh, though the Clean Power Plan was um, introduced in 2016, it was actually stayed by the Supreme Court. So the Clean Power Plan has never taken effect. The Supreme Court stated in a very unusual decision in 2016. Um, then you see that in the Trump administration, basically the Trump administration, you know, uses um, its um, authority to basically un try to undo as much as it can um, the um, regulatory efforts of the Obama administration. The Trump administration never undoes the endangerment finding. It senses. Uh, it sensed probably the legal risk that would be involved in trying to undo the endangerment finding, but it does try to very severely weaken the car rules that the Obama administration had introduced. Um, it repeals the Clean Power Plan regulating power plant emissions, which again had never taken effect and replaces that Clean Power Plan with something much weaker called the Affordable Clean Energy Rule, which in turn itself was vacated at the beginning of 2021. Okay, so you see here the the perils of using the regulatory route. Um, it's very unstable and the next administration can come in as the Trump administration did and undo regulatory efforts. The other reason, um, perhaps not highlighted so clearly on this slide that the regulatory route is perilous is that the courts have the, uh, poten there's the potential that the courts could make it very, could um, undo regulations or prevent them from coming into effect, as we saw with the Clean Power Plan. And this is a very real potential that um, the Biden administration has to keep in mind, um, given, given um, 
the potential that in the West Virginia v. EPA case, uh, the Supreme Court could end up constricting the authority of EPA to regulate greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act. Okay, so this slide, while showing the potential to use the regulatory route, also shows the limits of using the regulatory route. So where are we as of today? Okay, so where are we as of today in kind of hoping to have a um, national framework that would address those five sectors um, that are the major contributors to greenhouse gas emissions at the federal level. Okay, well, um, we have rejoined the Paris Agreement. Okay, but where are we in terms of those five sectors? Um, electricity uh, um, emissions are not regulated as of today at the federal level. Okay, um, agricultural emissions are not really regulated today at the federal level. Um, emissions from buildings are not really regulated today at the federal level, okay? There is one bright spot, which is that um, we see that emissions from motor vehicles um, are regulated um, at the federal level under the Clean Air Act. The Biden administration in 2021 uh, was successful in, in promulgating a stronger set of, uh, of uh, GHG emission um, uh, rules regulating car emissions. Um, so, so this is a bright spot that um, there's some federal regulation in the leading sector, the, the, the sector, the transportation sector, which is the leading sector, uh, the, the number one sector responsible for GHG emissions in the country. But all these other various sectors, they're, they're still not really regulated at the federal level. Okay, so that takes me to this question. Well, why have we basically been, except for the car standards to date, um, why, why has the US so far been unable to really develop um, a comprehensive national you know, framework for regulating climate change? You know, maybe things will change, right? Maybe uh, President Biden will be able to get Build Back Better through or some version of it through. Maybe you know, the Supreme Court will you know, still uh, uh, preserve some authority for EPA to regulate power plant regulations and West Virginia v. EPA. Uh, but as of today, certainly, um, there seems to be something lacking from the picture, okay? Now, before I go into some of the potential explanations, I did want to just caveat this doom and gloom by noting, as many people do, that, you know, just because nothing significant, well, just because maybe it would be better to say the federal government has been underperforming, um, that doesn't mean that nothing's been happening in the country to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And so what this slide is showing is how, you know, quite a respectable number of states in the country have established by legislation or through executive order or through a combination of legislation and executive order and, and regulation, quite ambitious goals in some cases for uh, decarbonizing um, the, their economies. Okay, so it's not all doom and gloom. And even in states, this is a very messy slide, I realize, but the point of this slide is to show that even in states that don't have some sort of economy-wide target for decarbonizing, sometimes those states have taken some interesting measures, like, for example, trying to decarbonize the power sector by establishing um, sort of some goals for introducing um, uh, renewable energy into their power sectors. Okay, okay so... Now let's go back to the question, the title for the session, which is, well, you know, why this underperformance at the national level? Okay. So I, I'm going to start with uh, Professor Mildinger's hypo double representation hypothesis, okay, for the, um, the slow progress in implementing greenhouse gas emission regulation um, comprehensively at the national level. So his hypothesis, which I think is a very interesting one, I'm thinking about it uh, quite a bit recently, is that first of all, climate policy is redistributive. It involves basically uh, transferring resources from various sectors of the economy, transportation, electricity, and so forth, uh, where fossil fuels are used to you know, introducing, uh, transferring those resources away from the use of fossil fuels and restructuring those various sectors of the economy. So we have to stop using those gas stoves. We have to uh, replace them maybe with induction stoves. We have to change our cars from being uh, powered by gasoline to being made electric vehicles, okay? So it's a very, it's a, it's a major redistributive undertaking. And Mildinger's hypothesis is that there's a lot of opposition across the political spectrum 
um, or there has been a lot of opposition across the political spectrum. So both on the left and the right in industrialized countries um, to, to, to this massive redistributive effort. So he says, therefore, that this opposition is doubly represented. In other words, it's represented on both the left and the right. And he says that basically uh, the opponents of the you know, massive redistribution that's necessary, what, what they've tended to do is to use the veto points in the politi political and legislative process, sorry, the political, legislative, and legal process to, to basically inhibit change. So to use the voting rules, say in the US Senate, um, to use the courts um, to block change. And so his um, kind of, more positive suggestion is that to overcome this double representation problem, what you need to think about when you're designing climate policy is you need to think about over time developing broader coalitions to support climate change. Okay, so I think there is when within thinking about the U.S. trajectory on climate uh, policy, I think there there is some you know evidence for his double representation hypothesis. Okay, so this year for example in 2021, uh, 2021, 2022, we can think about what has inhibited the passage of the Build Back Better legislation um, through the Senate. Remember, it passed the House, basically passed the House pretty much on party line though. Um, all the supporters in the House were Democrats. Um, and, and what's prevented it from getting through the Senate? Well, two Democratic senators. So this is, you know, uh, evidence, I think, for uh, Mildred's hypothesis that opposition is not just um, on, on the right in, in the Republican Party in the U.S. context, but also within the Democratic Party. And, you know, if we kind of wanted to underscore that uh, the opposition of two U.S. senators, to, two Democratic senators to build back better is not a historical ob um, aberration, we can think back to the efforts in 1993 and 2009 um, to um, introduce uh, climate legislation, um, which are similar in some ways to the 2021 effort. In both two, in 1993 and 2009, in both those, in, in all these three cases, you had um, Democratic presidents in their first term in office trying within their first two years of being in office at a time when they when the Democrats controlled both the House and the Senate to get through climate legislation, okay? And in all three cases, they, they failed. Now, of course, we still don't know what's going to happen in the Biden administration. Uh, you know, maybe they'll be successful in getting through this legislation, but if past is, is prologue, the 1993 and 2009 efforts should maybe make us not, not so surprised in historical terms about, uh, uh, to see that the Democrats yet again are having difficulty getting through climate change legislation. Okay. Um, uh, and also, um, I kind of have already mentioned that not only are there various kind of veto points in the legislative process, but also the courts can serve as a, blo a blockage point um, for, you know, getting comprehensive reform. Okay, so um, I won't spend too much time on this slide, but just out of curiosity, I kind of looked at who were the petitioners in the West Virginia EPA case that the court heard this, um, this term. And in particular, um, uh, you know, which are the 19 states that are basically, you know, the petitioners in this case seeking to limit EPA's authority under the Clean Air Act to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from the power sector. And what do you see when you look at the these 19 states um, is that um, uh, 17 out of the 19 states have Republican governors, okay? And 17 of the 19 states have higher greenhouse gas per emissions per capita than the national average. So you can see maybe the, the 19, I don't like to single out these, <laughs> these states that are petitioning um, to limit uh, EPA authority under the Clean Air Act, but you can see in a way that they, these 19 states, you can see those as an example of an interest group that basically, um, perhaps because of its own uh, heavy reliance, generally speaking, on fossil fuels, um, um, is, is seeking to block change, in this case, using the courts to try to block change. Okay. Now, so Mildred's hypothesis is one hypothesis for the current state of play. Um, what are some other hypotheses? Another hypothesis is sort of the opposite of Mildinger's. 
maybe the problem isn't that there's, you know, widely diffused opposition across the political spectrum. Maybe the problem is that there's an intense concentration of opposition um, on, um, in the, within the Republican Party. Okay, and because another way of looking at why it's been difficult to get build back better through the Senate might be well it's not maybe it's not entirely the Democrats fault, why can't any of the Republican senators sort of come on board and compensate for the difficulty of getting things, getting enough Democratic support. Okay, so this slide, um, this is some opinion poll evidence that basically you know illustrates what probably many people were watching you know intuitively think, which is um, that. There is more uh, um, opposition um, on, on the, um, among Republican supporters to addressing climate change than among Democratic supporters. Now, what, what, is, what was the question here in this opinion poll? It wasn't exactly, the, uh, you know, do you support regulation of climate change? The question here was, how concerned are you about your community being harmed by climate change? Okay, but what, what, what did the, that question um, asked in an opinion poll? Um, uh, published in 2020, what did it yield? It yield that actually 51% um, of Trump voters were not at all concerned <laughs> about their community being um, harmed by climate change. And an additional 25% were not too concerned. In contrast, um, there's a lot more concern among Biden voters, okay, with 66% being concerned, okay? So there clearly is, um, you know, polarization, I would say, on the issue of climate change, okay? But one sort of, while there is polarization, an interesting thing to keep in mind, which I discovered in compiling these slides for this presentation, is that there's widespread belief in the country now that um, climate change is occurring. So this is some data from uh, the Yale program on climate change communication, uh, which shows that um, basically 72% of the country agrees that climate change is occurring. And um, so the, the closer you get to the darker colors here, um, the stronger the intensity of the belief. But, um, but it's, you know, I think this is encouraging, okay? Okay, now what are some other potential explanations for maybe why we've been so slow at the national level to get, um, uh, uh, a uh, policy. One is maybe the low salience of the climate change issue, you know, um, although I'm very focused on it in my day-to-day -day work, many people are probably not so focused on climate change and maybe more concerned about immediate issues like high inflation, high gas prices, okay. Another potential explanation might be one that you know, takes us away from politics. All the explanations that I've quoted to so far, the idea that uh, there's opposition on both the left and the right to addressing climate change, the idea that um, uh, maybe there's this intense opposition um, among Republicans to addressing climate change, the idea that climate change is not very politically salient. These are all political explanations, but maybe we should, you know, maybe, maybe politics is not, not the sole reason. <laughs> you know, uh, maybe, maybe um, the sort of underperformance at the federal level is also linked to kind of the state of technology. And until we perceive real alternatives to the fossil fuel economy, maybe we won't, you know, be so eager to actually, you know, um, regulate away the use of fossil fuels. Okay, so from that point of view, you would expect to see more change and more regulation in areas where um, th there actually are technological alternatives to the use of fossil fuels. Okay, so an interesting kind of development um, that I just want to highlight here is um, uh, the trend towards uh, more purchases of electric vehicles. Now, electric vehicles still account for a very small share of new car purchases. But as you can see from this slide, there's, there is now a very significant, in, in the past few years, been a very significant um, increase in electric vehicle purchases. And they are increasingly accounting for a larger share of new vehicle purchases. Okay, okay great. So having talked about various hypotheses for where we are now, um, as I said at the outset, I didn't want to leave, uh, conclude the presentation on a kind of down note. So um, 
um, inspired in a way by uh, Matteo Mildinger's kind of um, uh, political hypothesis um, uh, for where we are now, I thought it might be interesting to point to some efforts to sort of broaden the political constituency for uh, 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 aggressive federal action on climate change. Because if we if we agree with Mildinger's efforts, and maybe even if we don't, um, the the key to eventually getting sort of a comprehensive policy at the national level will be to sort of bro broaden the constituency of potential supporters. Okay, so there are some very interesting promising efforts um, at the national level and at the state and local level. Okay, so I'm going to highlight two things. One is um, the move that we've seen over the past few years to incorporate environmental justice into climate policy. And this is a move that I think started at the state level in some of the states that have been particularly innovative in the climate space. So in California um, and in New York State, I know the New York State example better. So um, in, in um, uh, New York State under uh, climate law that the state passed in 2019, um, disadvantaged communities are to receive at least 35% of spending on clean energy. The goal is actually to uh, allocate more than 35% of the benefits of, of spending on clean energy um, to disadvantaged communities and hopefully get to 40%. Um, and this idea was picked up by the Biden administration, which has launched this Justice 40 initiative. And the Biden administration has basically um, com committed to the idea that vulnerable communities should receive at least 40% of the benefits of climate and clean energy investments. So this, in my view, one of the things this does, it's obviously um, doing a number of things like ad addressing um, uh, uh, urgent environmental needs in historically marginalized communities, but it's also potentially a way of broadening the constituency that will support climate policy. And maybe that can help to um, uh, create a path, a political pathway over time to um, comprehensive national response, okay? Uh, another sort of optimistic uh, uh, development that I wanna highlight is just the diffusion of state and local government policies on climate change. And I, I've already shown you this slide, but I think it's it's worth noting again, just, you know, perhaps it's not unexpected that some of these places like New York and California have introduced, you know, uh, very aggressive commitments to decarbonize their states. But it, the move to decarbonize is now extended beyond those two states and extended to other states and extended at the local level. And, you know, these, um, the, I think, the sort of what I would think of as the normalization of decarbonization. Maybe that also helps to create kind of expectations and set expectations that help to lay the groundwork over time for, um, uh, for more change at the federal level. So um, I, I wanna leave some more time for questions. Um, so I, I, I'm gonna, I just skipped over a few of my slides. And um, I, I just wanna skip here to the last slide before opening things up for questions. And by the way, I should have said this at the beginning, but people should feel free to put questions in the Q&A box there. Um, and, and then um, I'll be able to see the questions if you enter them in the Q&A box. So um, what I wanted to conclude with is um, just to raise a question. Um, I've talked about underperformance at the federal level um, um, uh, and you know the, the need to do better and some of the obstacles um, uh, that, that may have prevented the development of a national framework and the potential um, that the Supreme Court may kind of inhibit the regulatory path. Um, I did want to acknowledge, of course, that we're living in this period of uh, uh, the war in Ukraine. And a very interesting question, I think, will be what will be the effect of the war in Ukraine for uh, climate change policy in the United States? Um, I think, you know, I, I don't know how many of you saw this kind of uh, discussion in the New York Times um, in March, but I, I think the discussion in the Times piece kind of set out the issue very nicely. On the one hand, uh, we could think of the war in Ukraine as creating more momentum to, dis, uh, to uh, decarbonize um, in, in the US and certainly in Europe, uh, 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 given that you know, Ru Russia's economy um, is very heavily uh, financed through, through the sale and production of fossil fuels. But on the other hand, the war in Ukraine could also accelerate the use of um, and production of fossil fuels within the US. Um, and we've already seen, of course, um, moves within the US to try to, um, you know, uh, uh, 
put a tax a, a freeze on on gas taxes, um, and we've seen kind of even the Biden administration open up uh, public lands for more uh, fossil fuel drilling. So. I, I think it's very unclear what, at this stage, the impact of the war in Ukraine will be on climate change policy. So with that, I'd, I'd really very much like to see if people have questions or comments, even reactions. I'm open to reactions as well. Uh, somebody's asking me whether um, I'd like to have my name uh, preferred for another presentation. Of course, I'd be very happy to provide another presentation on this topic or on other topics that I'm working on. Um, as I was mentioning, I'm very interested these days in local environmental policy, in part because I've been dis disillusioned by what's happening <laughs> at higher levels of government in the US. Uh, yeah, so somebody's asking me what steps would I really recommend to overcome the obstacles you've outlined? I mean, I, I think um, I, sort of, I guess, alluding to what I was just saying a few seconds ago, I really feel that we have to think locally <laughs> in this case. I mean, um, at least from my vantage point, sitting here in New York City in Greenwich Village, um, I feel that uh, there is a lot of potential to do interesting things at the state and local government level, especially perhaps in democratic states uh, where you don't have to worry, you know, so much about state level preemption of, of local initiatives. But at, at the local level, there's the potential to do things to regulate, say, emissions from buildings in particular, which are the largest source of emissions at the local level. There's also the potential to, I think, at the local level to kind of um, start to you know, educate people about the pervasiveness of their impact on climate change through the, the foods they, they eat, through um, the products we consume within cities. Um, I think an, an interesting development will be, will, will cities start to try to, to influence, you know, the, 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 pro, uh, the products that are used in, um, in constructing buildings? We've already seen at the local level some efforts to uh, ban uh, new uh, natural gas hookups and new constructions to ensure that new construction does not use natural gas. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to see where those efforts go. I, my general feeling is, you know, any local jurisdiction can only have a very small impact on greenhouse gas emissions um, and in, in the United States or in the world. Uh, but it can still have some impact. But part of what we're doing at the local level and at the state level is kind of creating um, creating the platform for broader societal change. And that I think is really a very, very significant um, and, and important thing that can be done by acting locally. Now at the national level, I think that I, 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 I actually thought that President Biden and others really were thinking very wisely about trying to use spending as a way of trying to promote change. Um, and, and, and we'll see whether that that kind of effort can also uh, pay off. Um, somebody asked a really interesting question here about will national security arguments strengthen the arguments for addressing climate change? So national security arguments have played into questions about climate change for a long time now. I do think that you know, this could be one uh, implication of the war in Ukraine. This people are predicting for a while that climate change you know, could um, lead to, uh, to war. And some people attributed the war in Syria, for example, in part to climate change. Um, and, and here in the, with the war in Ukraine, we see the potential that the fossil fuel economy can power a war, finance a war. And so you know, potentially these arguments will start to resonate. Um, uh, and I, I think this is a great question. Uh, how, how do you convince people at the other end of the political, the other, the conservative end of the political spectrum um, to be partners in addressing climate change? And, and I think there, you know, this is where you, I, I, I think we have to think very carefully about how do we um, bring in people who feel that they will lose from climate change, from, from climate change policy, how, how do we bring them in to seeing this as something that they can win from and benefit from? 
And I guess that's where I was hoping that some of the spending initiatives that the Biden administration was trying to encourage through Build Back Better, and some of them they did get into the bipartisan infrastructure law, that some of those initiatives would carry forward. Okay, so I realize it's three o'clock um, and I don't wanna hold people up. Uh, so I'd really like to thank everybody. And I see there are a lot of interesting questions um, that are now appearing in the Q&A. And um, I very much hope uh, people should feel free to reach out to me. Um, um, uh, in, by email, and I, I hope that you um, are, feel interested in carrying on the conversation, either with me or with others. I'd um, very much like to hear from former students and alumni of the law school in general. So uh, I wish you um, a good rest of the weekend, and if you're in New York, I hope you can enjoy the lovely weather outside today. <laughs>